Welcome to First United Lutheran Church. This is the message from Sunday. It's our prayer that this message touches your heart and helps to guide you in your life. Let's listen. And I have a thank you card here. It's from Tara Anderson, the STI coordinator, I believe, wanted to say thanks a bunch. Your donation is greatly appreciated at the um, LSS Meals on Wheels at the Four Seasons Center. So they'd like to thank us very much for helping out there. That is all the announcements I have. Does anybody have any announcements that they'd like to share that did not get to me? All right. On the prayer list, we had the John Wahlberg family. He passed away recently. Uh, so please keep his family, uh, John's family, in your prayers in the upcoming future, along with Paula, Sally, and Penny, Marilyn, Barb, and Jeff. They are um, in need of our prayers and going through some tough times. So a little extra prayer will help out. And then also Gary and Minnie in Mexico, they're always fighting a tough battle that they choose to fight. They're led to do it. And anybody that's talked with Gary or listened to him here, he's definitely very passionate about what he's doing. So that's... Uh, um, they got something set on their hearts for sure. Please join me in an opening prayer. Lord, you are mighty and powerful. We are unable to pay our debt to you. And in your great mercy, you sent Jesus to bail us out so we can be with you. We desire to be like Jesus, but our pride gets in our way. We think we are better than others. Please help us understand everyone is made by you for a purpose and we should love everyone as you love them. Encourage us to help each other, our neighbors, friends, and people we don't know, showing kindness modeled after Jesus. Let worship today change our hearts to act more like Jesus and increase our desire to have a closer relationship with you. Amen. Please join me in Psalms 139. You've searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You know, you perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out, my lying down. You are familiar, familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, Lord, you know it completely. You hem me in behind and before and you lay your open hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to obtain. We're going to have opening music. I was just joking about me being recruited to singing. I will be part of the congregation singing here. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, well, as, um, as we all know, today is St. Patty's Day. And I see some green here and there amongst us. I'm doing my best to speak Irish because I'm just a dumb Norwegian. But uh, anyways, uh, in, in uh, respect for that, partly, and because this is just a plain old great song, uh, we'd like to sing. A, it's a song from Revival in Belfast by Robin Mark. I'd like you to have uh, to, to stand as you're able and to sing with us. As sure as gold is precious and the honey sweet So you love this city and you love these streets 
Every child out playing by their own front door And every baby laying on the bedroom floor Every dreamer dreaming in her dead end job And every driver driving through the rush hour mom I feel it in my spirit, feel it in my bones You're gonna send revival, sing them all back home I can hear that thunder in the distance Like a train on the edge of the town And I can feel the brooding of your spirit Saying lay your burdens down Lay your burdens down From the preacher preaching when the well is dry To the lost soul reaching for a higher high From the young man working through his hopes and fears and to the widow walking through her veil of tears Every man and woman, every old and young Every father's daughter, every mother's son I feel it in my spirit, feel it in my bones You're gonna send revival, bring them all back home I can hear that thunder in the distance Like a train on the edge of the town And I can feel the brooding of your spirit Lay your burdens down Lay your burdens down Revive With your fire, revive us, revive us, revive us with your. Amen to that. Uh, turn to somebody and tell them you're looking and sounding particularly Irish this morning. Top of the morning to ya. As most of you make your way back to your seats, anybody that feels like a child <laughs> should make their way to the front few rows. We have some open seats, and uh, there's going to be an excellent Muppet show.
thank you. I think it's number one. Uh, just a quick word about this puppet show this morning. Whoa, Peachy, you're up. Wow. <laughs> Wait a second, she'll really be up. Uh, this song we're going to do this morning is, is from a story out of the New Testament. It's called, uh, Peter and John went to pray, silver and gold have I none. And uh, that's a puppet show screen right there. Go and have a seat and pray soon it'll start. The, and I think that maybe some of us learned this song when we were kids in Sunday school. Uh, they went walking and leaping and praising God. So this is a little lesson um, for the kids this morning that comes straight out of, straight out of the book of Acts. So um, let's let the music do the talking. And the puppets. Peter and John went to pray. Met a lame man on the way. He asked for alms and held out his palms. And this is what Peter did say Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I you. In the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, in Jesus' name rise up and walk. The man went walking and leaping and praising God. Walking and leaping and praising God. In the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. In Jesus' name rise up and walk. The man went walking and leaping and praising God. Walking and leaping and praising God. In the name of Jesus Christ. Well, the frog and, 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 and Grover, they're not feeling particularly bouncy today. See if you can hit the ceiling with them. <laughs> okay, and what about, what about Kermit there? He, he should be able to jump high. Okay, there we go. Well done. And uh, we got some food today. We got the food police brought the food back, so we're in good shape. We also have, uh, kind of, I'm calling an audible this morning. We have a, uh, a very, very special guest with us this morning. And by the way, welcome to all visitors. Um, and I wanted to uh, say another million, billion thank yous to Norm and Mary for this beautiful uh, gift that they've, uh, they've blessed the church with. And I'd like to call on Pastor Bob to bless the piano with a song, if you would, please.
I agree. Absolutely beautiful. Great job. Uh, we'll next have the offering. So if the ushers could come up. may be seated. We'll continue with the confession. Almighty God, Heavenly Father, we thank you for your loving and gracious gift of sins that I bring before you today. I have sinned against you in thought and words and daily actions business and in my daily life I have fallen short of your glory and have not been kind of person of me to be. Give me and cleanse me from my sins. Thank you Jesus has paid the price for my forgiveness and now I lay my life before you. Bring me to the place that I please both in body and In Jesus name I pray. Amen. We read in 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 and 9, that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. God declares to us in Psalms 103, verses 10 through 12, that he has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor rewarded us according to our guilty deeds. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his mercy towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our wrongdoings from us. And now you get to put up with me a little bit longer. We'll move on to uh, our readings. First one is Proverbs 19, verses 10 through 19. Try to get on the mic here a little bit better, Connie. It is not fitting for a fool to live in luxury. How much worse for a slave to rule over a princess. A person's wisdom yields patience. It is to one's glory to overlook an offense. A king's rage is like the roar of a lion, but his favor is like dew on the grass. A foolish child is a father's ruin, and a, a quarrelsome wife is like constant dripping of a leaky roof. Houses and wealth are inherited from parents, but prud a prudent wife is from the Lord. Laziness brings on deep sleep, and the shiftless go hungry. Whoever keeps commandments keeps their lives, but whoever shows contempt 
for their ways will die. Whoever is kind to the poor lends to the Lord, and he will reward them for what they have done. Discipline your children, for in that there is hope. But do not be a willing party to their death. A hot-tempered person must pay the penalty. Rescue them, and you will have to do it again. The second reading comes from Revelation, a long time from now, maybe, or soon, depending on who you ask. It's uh, chap uh, chapter 6, verses 12 through 17. I watched as he opened the sixth seal. There was a great earthquake. The sun turned black like sackcloth made of goat hair. The whole moon turned blood red, and the stars in the sky fell to the earth as figs drop from a fig tree when shaken by a strong wind. The heavens receded like a scroll being rolled up, and every mountain and island was removed from its place. Then the kings of the earth, the princes, the generals, the rich, the mighty, and everyone else, both slave and free, hid in caves and among the rocks of the mountains. They called to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of the wrath has come, and who can withstand it? Well, while we're getting organized here with this, uh, with this uh, lapel mic, earbud, whatever you want to call it, let's uh, take a second and ponder as we share this together about what we really, truly believe. These are some strong phrases. They're in conflict with a lot of the world around us. And so it's wise, I think, for us to give a little bit of think as we're going through this. What's this worth to me to believe these things? Let's stand and confess our faith together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth, and even Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again, and he ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And while we remain standing, um, I'll read the uh, gospel, which is found today in Luke chapter 23, or 8, verses 23 through 25. This is uh, another well-known account. Uh, you've probably heard messages on this one before. Um, but there's some really great stuff in this. And so we read, As they sailed, he fell asleep. And a squall came down on the lake, so that the boat was being swamped, and they were in great danger. And the disciples went and woke him, saying, Master, Master, we're going to drown. And he got up and rebuked the wind and the raging waters, and the storm subsided, and all was calm. Where is your faith? He asked his disciples. <laughs> No kidding. And in fear and amazement, they ask one another, Who is this? Who is this? He commands even the winds and the water, and they obey him. And uh, here ends the reading of the gospel for today. Lord, we ask that you would add your wisdom and blessing to our opened ears and opened hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, you may be seated. Check, check, there we go, here to come. And let's see if this guy is working. Why, yes it is. So we've been talking about a walk through Judea. So this is kind of part three of that. Uh, three Sundays in a row we've been following Jesus Christ through the 
uh, some of the paths that he walked during his ministry. And I'm very, very, very careful to call this country Judea. Because as you remember from three weeks ago, I was explaining where the term Palestine came from, and it really did not come into common usage until 1967. It's Judea. It is Judea, and that's the term we're going to use um, because if it's good enough for Jesus, why, it's good enough for me. So today, we leave the land, and we're going to spend a little bit of time out on the Sea of Galilee. And I'm going to add, uh, I had a, one extra verse here that uh, I did, I guess I forgot to tell Connie to add. So if you've got your Bibles, please find Luke chapter 8, Luke chapter 8, beginning in verse 22. We should have added one verse to that, and that's my fault. Um, on one of those days, it says, Jesus and his disciples got into a boat, and he said to them, let us go over to the other side of the lake. And so they launched out. And while they were sailing along, he fell asleep. He fell asleep, and a fierce gale of wind descended on the lake, and they began to be swamped. And they came to Jesus and woke him up. Master, we're perishing. And he got up, rebuked the wind and the surging waves, and they stopped. Okay, so, so that's what we've just read. Okay, so there's three aspects of this that I want to spend a little bit of time talking about this morning. Predicament, prayer, and a purpose. There's three little things that come out of this thing. And so let's, we'll just dive into this. First point that I wanted to make is, is this, is very interesting. It's Jesus, they're in a, they are in a fierce predicament. I don't know if any of you have ever been in a dire situation on Lake of the Woods. Um, I was in one uh, in Prince Albert, Saskatchewan with my father-in-law who's passed now. But he uh, and I had been out fishing. And we were on a little 14-foot little boat, and the waves were this high, and the engine was falling off the back of the boat, and it was truly terrifying. Didn't know what was going to happen. Um, it's a terrible, fearful thing. But this one started out with Jesus. Did you notice that? They got into the boat, and Jesus said, Well, here, let's, uh, let's cross this lake. And so I'm wondering about this. Did God, did Jesus not know what was about to happen? I think he did. But here's the thing. Do we not ask ourselves the same question about the predicaments that we get into? Core of today's message is Romans 8.28. For he works together for good all things for those who love the Lord, who are called according to his purpose. The predicaments that we get into sometimes. If we take this verse that it's literal, that means that every step of our life, every situation that we get into, God is working in that. He's putting things together, and He knows what's going to happen, and He's got a reason for it. But, come on. Jesus led them into this storm? Does He have a purpose? I will say he had a very large purpose. Because now, as they're in the boat, they get the sail set, and they're making their way across the Sea of Galilee, Jesus falls asleep. What? What kind of a teacher, what kind of a leader is this? Puts him in a boat, and he goes and crawls into some sailcloth, puts his head down, and... Uh, He's out. Well, the first thing, this, this is very important. This is a very important little lesson that's just kind of forgotten sometimes, is that Jesus, Jesus, while he was here on this earth, he was truly, honest to goodness, 100% human being. He was actual flesh and bone, same as you and me. When he skinned his knee, it hurt. So that point is, when you skin your knee, he gets it. He was exhausted, and he fell asleep. So he knows 
when you get exhausted and so forth, he gets it. There is no experience that we can live in this world that the God Almighty in human flesh did not experience. So, he's exhausted, he falls asleep, and this is when the trouble begins. The, uh, the, uh, they're sailing along, and this storm comes up, and you had better believe that that is exactly how things play out for you and me also. You see, we're sailing along in life. We're thinking things are going pretty smoothly. We're confident, you see. God is leading us. Romans 8.28, that's mine. Everything works together for good for those that love the Lord. And then all of a sudden, this storm blows up out of nowhere, and this is hurricane strength. This is a bad storm that the disciples are in. Here's the thing. It shouldn't have happened, right? Should it? Because I've heard teachers say that if you really love God, if you're really in the will of God, you're never going to have a storm in your life. Uh, this little scripture flies in the face of that because the disciples were smack dab in the middle of a terrific storm. Now Jesus had personally, he personally led them into this situation and now he's sleeping in some sackcloth or sailcloth. And they're fearing for their lives. So here's an interesting thing. Among the disciples, there's some very seasoned fishermen. Guys have been on the boats on this lake their whole life. They've seen storms. They were men who were accustomed to finding their own way out of a jam. And you better believe that everything in their power, they were doing it. You and I are like that, very much. We are like people who take pride in the fact that we can think our way out of a wet paper sack. So as well, most of us. <laughs> but in fact, sometimes we have had to find our way out of, you know, these Houdini boxes, coffins that are chained up and they got locks on them and they're thrown into the water and you only got a certain amount of time before you get out or you're going to die. We have probably, all of us, used our own skills and abilities to get out of some fairly tricky jams. Today it didn't matter. All the skills of the disciples had been used up. This must have been a hurricane strength. Sometimes, you see, the storm is just too big for us to handle. That's the predicament. Secondly, here we go. Prayer. It finally sunk into the disciples that they were in trouble. They were over their head, literally. They needed help from a source bigger than what they were. It used up their skills, all their abilities, out of ideas. And the storm is getting worse. You ever been in that place? Of course. So they prayed. And they didn't, <laughs> they didn't pray a flowery prayer either. They did not say, Lord, we knoweth that thou resideth in the heavenly places, and that thou ownest the cattle on a thousand hills, and thereunto and wherefore we beseecheth thee to hearken unto our needs. Nothing wrong with those kinds of prayers. They have their place. That was not the situation they were in. Much simpler. They came and hit the deck of the ship on their knees as they skidded up to the Lord where he was sleeping. And they said, Lord, help us. We are all going to die. In fact, in Mark, they started out their prayer with a bit of a complaint. Here's what they said in Mark's account. They said, Teacher, you, you don't even care that we're perishing. <coughs> so there's a couple lessons here about prayer. First, you're in a jam. You're in over your head. Pray honestly. If there ever was an honest prayer, this was it. The disciples come. God, help me. I'm going to die. And they meant it. If you're scared, tell them. If you've got a complaint, complain. Speak.
speak truthfully to God what's in here. That's what he wants to hear. We don't always need the finery and the flowery speech. But here's, here's another very important lesson. Jesus knew about this storm. He might have been sleeping through it, but here's the thing. Jesus did not calm the storm until the disciples brought the problem before him. You see, Jesus wants us to discuss our problems in life with him. He wants you to involve him in your life. He did not stop the storm until they prayed. All right, so that's straightforward and simple. That's point number two, prayer. Pray earnestly and honestly. Purpose. That's the main point of our little uh, message this morning. There is truly a purpose in everything that God leads his children to. Again, Romans 8.28, good one to memorize. We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to the ones who are called according to his purpose. According to this promise, there's not a thing that happens in your life by fluke. Nothing. The colds, uh, being tired, uh, you know, just many, many examples. Nothing, nothing. According to this promise in Romans 8.28, there's nothing that happens in our life that uh, comes in there by chance. According to this promise, when Jesus told the disciples to get into that boat, he knew the storm was coming, and he had a purpose for doing this. Just because the storm came up doesn't mean that purpose got lost. Jesus had a lesson to teach. The disciples had a lesson to learn. Andre Crouch put it this way. If I'd never had a problem, I'd never know that God could solve them. I'd never know what faith in God could do. Now, sometimes I don't understand immediately what God's purpose is in a trial. I can't see it sometimes. Sometimes we see it quite immediately. Sometimes it takes a while for the lesson to sink through. Sometimes there are things that we will never know on this side of heaven. What could possibly be the purpose of God Almighty of that storm that I've described in Tennessee where a tornado came and was thundering like a train, and this young two-year-old girl heard that and was terrified, came running into her mom and dad's bedroom, crawled in between them on the bed. Surely this would be a safe place. And the storm dropped a tree in the house, and a huge branch punctured the roof, and it impaled and killed this little two-year-old. Girl, what can possibly God be thinking of in a situation like that? I, I don't know. I don't know. Other than I know, and I'm convinced, that that little two-year-old is sitting right on the lap of the Lord Jesus Christ. But I don't know why. There are some things that we will never know why. We won't. Which is where faith comes in. Jesus said that to the disciples. Where's your faith? <sighs> like the song says, blessed are you when you trust, when you just can't understand. Where's that purpose? Some of them we see. Like the prodigal son, we can see in the purpose of the hardship of the prodigal son that he had to learn a very hard lesson before he could come home and appreciate home and his father's goodness. I told the story once of a preacher who only had four fingers on his right hand. Well, three. Three fingers and a thumb. Sorry about that. He was a prodigal 
son of a preacher who wanted nothing to do with the church and his dad and you know preachers kids sometimes they go they run wild sometimes this one did he was running from God he took off down to Louisiana and he was working in a sawmill and his job was to help put the logs on the cradle get them sent through the big saw one day his hand got caught in a crack of the log that had been partially cut and his hand got stuck in there and he can't get out Nobody else around. He's stuck, and he knows he's got about 45 seconds before that saw. Going to split him in half. So I ask you, how long does it take for a person to straighten out their life? In dire conditions like this one, it took about 45 seconds. Because he was praying up a storm and there was no flowery language there either. God help me, I am going to die. And right at the very end, the log spun. And the only thing that was cut off was the one finger of his hand. How long does it take to square up our life before God in a, in a situation like that? It doesn't take very long at all. There's another story about Corey Ten Boom, and maybe some of us remember this story too. And she was interred in a uh, German death camp. She had smuggled in a Bible and couldn't find a place to read the Bible or have devotions or do anything to share her faith. Until one week, there was a terrible infestation broke out of lice in that bunkhouse. And she was lying by her sister Betsy and they were complaining about this. And they took out their Bible and they were complaining to God about their situation. And then they realized there was not a single guard in the bunkhouse. And nor would there ever be because what Nazi guard in their right mind would come into a bunkhouse that's full of lice. God can even use lice to his benefit. And so they had Bible studies. And so there were many, many, many women that were converted in that camp because of the lice. All right. What's the purpose of the lessons that come out of this storm? I'll give you four of them, I guess. One is that the disciples learned once and for all that Jesus Christ was Creator and God Almighty. They had watched Him perform miracles. They knew He was a healer. They knew He was a teacher. But this was something far beyond that. Peace, be still, He said to the storm. And the wind abated. And the waves died down. What was the point of that? Well, the disciples knew for sure that He was creator. He had power over, over nature. And that's one of the things that we, uh, that we use to talk about evidence that Jesus Christ was God. If God became a human being, if God Almighty really did that, you would expect, it would be one of the expectations that you would have, is that if he created it, he can control it. Here he did. Secondly, they learned that there is no situation that can separate them from the love and the care of God. And to go along with that, there is no situation that Jesus leads us into that He isn't right there in the thick of it with us. They were in a storm. Jesus was right there in that same storm. To the thief on the cross being crucified... Jesus Christ was on a cross being crucified. He understands. He gets it. He knows. And of course, their prayer skills were vastly improved on that day. Because we pray the best when we pray honestly. And it doesn't need to be fancy. We pray the best when it comes from our core. Predicament, prayer, 
purpose. Jesus does not lead us anywhere by mistake. He's always there, right there with us. Personally, he is there with us in the middle of any storm he leads us into. Also, the Lord did not calm the storm until the disciples brought the problem to him with prayer. Bring your problems to God. Fourth, be at peace no matter what storm you may be facing because there is a purpose in it. Here's the thing. Do not think that your sorrows and your pain are for you alone. When you suffer, you are much, much better at comforting others who are suffering. Because you get it. You understand it. You are a much better teacher when you have lived the lesson that you're teaching. And always, always, always remember this, that all things work together for the good of those who are called according to his purpose, which is every single Christian on earth. Sing one little part of a chorus here from Andre Crouch. See. I've had many tears and sorrows. I've had questions for tomorrow. There have been times I didn't know right from wrong. But in every situation, God gave blessed consolation that my trials serve to only make me strong. Sing it with me. Through it all, through it all, I've learned to trust in Jesus. I've learned to trust in God. Through it all, through it all, oh, I've learned to depend upon His Word. I've learned to depend upon His Word. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the fact there's no place on earth that we can be led into where you are not right beside us. There's some storms people are going through this morning. I don't know what they all are, but I pray that your Holy Spirit would stand beside everyone that's going through their storm and just give them assurance and peace that you're right there. Lord, I thank you for salvation. I thank you for this season of Easter. I thank you for your ministry on earth. Thank you for these gospels so that we can learn and understand the things that you came to earth to teach us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to share communion this morning. We have open communion. Anyone who names the name of Christ as Savior is is welcome to join us. And I will share now the words of institution. And if when you came in, you are uh, using one of our little communion kits, I will use that as we go through the words of institution. Paul is writing this. He says, Because I received from the Lord the same thing that I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, he took the bread... And when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. And do this in remembrance of me. Let us share together the broken body of our Lord Jesus Christ. Then in the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, and he said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. And this do also, as often as you drink it, 
in remembrance of me. And so let us share together the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because as he says, as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Now I'd ask the uh, servers and the ushers to come forward. And we would like to invite you to share in our fellowship the common communion that we all share together, which is salvation through the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. I invite you to come. The table is open. Now may the body and the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen and keep us in His grace. Amen. Let's stand and together we'll pray the Lord's Prayer and we'll close with, uh, with a hymn that is well with my soul. Let's pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us the trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. In our closing hymn, It Is Well With My Soul, you remember from the book of Revelation that we read today? It talked about the sky being rolled back like a scroll. That's one of the lyrics, I believe, in, uh, in this song that we're going to sing. So let's sing this together in closing.
Now receive the benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you, to be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you, give you his peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Amen. Thank you for listening to this message from First United Lutheran Church. Thank you.